Hello, good evening and welcome to EU Training's Beginner's Guide to the EPSO Organising and Prioritising Test. Before we begin, just to introduce myself, my name is Robin. I am a Chartered Occupational Psychologist and I specialise in the design of different types of uh, assessment test um, and also in the use of them. I've also done uh, a lot of training in these types of tests as well, so things like abstract reasoning, situational judgment tests, verbal numerical reasoning. I've got extensive experience with all, all those types of uh, those types of assessment. This um, webinar is a 30-minute free webinar um, and a recording as well, so you'll have access to this afterwards as well. Um, it's very theory focused, so what I'm going to do is talk through different types of questions that might come up in the organising and prioritising test, tell you how it works, give you a few tips and tricks. Now. We've only got half an hour and there's a lot of different types of questions, so I'm going to run through it reasonably quickly, um, some of the concepts. There'll be some examples up on screen, um, but I'll probably kind of push on through those quite quickly, but you can always go back and watch that recording again. Um, as I said, I'm going to try and give you some, some advice as well, some tips and tricks for all the different types of questions and overall. Um, but this questionnaire is designed, this webinar, sorry, is designed to be followed by a longer webinar, which is our pro tips session. And that includes a lot of practice questions, so a lot of chance to sort of put what we're learning now into practice. Um, and it also includes the opportunity for you to ask me questions directly. This is not an interactive session, this beginner one. Um, as I said, a lot to get through. But the, um, the, main, the, the main pro webinar is. So um, once we get to there, you'll have an opportunity to uh, kind of tackle these questions in a bit more depth. So to begin, to give you an overview of the test, it is a 30-minute test and it has 24 questions. Now that approximates to just over a minute per question, but these questions are done in sets. So typically you'll have one set of information and then you'll have three different questions off it. So really you've got just under four minutes to solve three questions all kind of related around the uh, same concept. <coughs> um, You'll be so. So you might have questions. For example, uh, you need to asking about stock levels, and it might say when do you need to restock something, or how many things will you need to restock, or which of these particular things will you need to stock. And all those questions will be related to the same table of information. Um, and you've got eight sets of these different tables of information. Um, you'll be provided with a small whiteboard and a calculator for taking notes as you go along. Now, it doesn't seem to be a heavily mathematical test, but it's still useful. To, you might have to work out some, some sums, some multiplication, etc. So you're given a calculator to support you with that. And it's not based on knowing things. It's a skill, what we call a skill-based assessment. So um, going in, there's the, you'll be applying different skills, but you don't have to know things. So for example, you work with time differences, but you don't have to know the different time differences. You don't need to know about different time zones, for example. You just need to be able to work with the skills of, convert when, of converting time zones. So this is an overview for, um, for our session today. Uh, we're going to start with the introduction overview. We're kind of running through that now uh, and some of the challenges you might face. Then we're going to look at different question types. <laughs> that uh, might well come up during the uh, during the assessment. Um, we're going to go into a little bit of depth on each of those, give some sort of individual tips, and then we're going to give some overall tips and tricks at the end. And hopefully, um, hopefully you'll find plenty of this useful in terms of learning how to prepare and also how to tackle these questions when you get to them. There are a lot of different question types to cover. It's quite a broad, um, quite a diverse set of uh, set of things that, that, that you're expected to know when you're looking at organizing and prioritizing. Um, so what the test is looking at is how quickly you can work with kind of reasonably complicated information data um, in order to make judgments, uh, organize things, and uh, pick priorities. What you'll be doing is looking through complicated, complicated information and trying to pick out which parts of it are relevant. So you're given different tables and charts. Uh, you're given questions, and the questions will clue you in as to what you're looking for on those tables and charts. And then you're given a multiple choice uh, answer as well. So you don't have to work it out exactly necessarily. Sometimes a strong estimate can be enough, or, or, or sometimes it can be the case that multiple of the answer options are, 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 are effective, and you're just trying to find the best one. So it's a little bit different from kind of a pure calculation or, or something like that. 
So I'm going to talk you through a few of the challenges you might face. So there's a, one thing is that there's a lot of different types of questions. Um, so it's not uh, learn one skill and you'll be fine. Um, it's not just timetables, for example. Um, so the best way to, 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 to sort of kind of prepare for that is to think about the different types of questions that we're going to go through today and, and think about where your strengths lie there, where your weaknesses may lie, and to make sure you focus on those weaknesses uh, and practicing that those types of questions in particular. Um, but also being aware that, that, that there's lots of, that EPSO can throw anything at you with these questionnaires. So, so there could be kind of things that aren't covered. So just make sure your skills, your, your approach to these questions is as refined and you're as ready to go as possible. Um, there's a large amount of information usually provided, and most of that isn't relevant to the immediate question. So we talked about multi-part questions. <clears throat> the first part might only be relevant to a specific row of information, for example. Another part might need you to compare a couple of columns, but you never need to really take in the whole table at once, or very rarely do you need to do that. Um, typically, that no, though you will need to look at different parts of the, the table, different parts of the information, how it interacts. So you're not looking at, typically you're not looking at the whole table, everything that happens, but you'll, what you will need to do is maybe look at one specific, a couple of specific rows and then the columns related to them, etc. Hopefully this will make more sense as we're going through examples. Um, Sometimes you'll have competing requirements and you'll need to make compromises, so you'll need to be able to make a call on when to go for a particular option. And of course, there's time pressure and difficult questions in there, so sometimes you will, uh, you'll find yourself kind of pressed for time. Again, pra getting a lot of practice in and knowing what to expect and making sure that you're skilled in different areas is, is likely to be very helpful for kind of making the time pressure less pressuring. So there's a range of trainable skills. What I mean by trainable skill is something that you can practice and you can get better at. So things like reading timetables, figuring out time differences and time zones. These are things that by looking at these types of questions or even kind of bus timetables or plane timetables or, or whatever can help you, help you develop as a skill and <clears throat> make you more ready for the questionnaire itself. Um, now, I also train in numerical, verbal, and abstract reasoning, and I've noticed a few similarities with uh, with each of those. With numerical reasoning, um, if you're familiar with that, you often have to look at a table of information and quickly pick out the right information. This is a very important skill in um, in this assessment as well, so being able to figure out what is relevant to the question being asked and not being overwhelmed by the information overall. Um, now, you need verbal reasoning skills because you need to understand what the question is asking. There's a, there's a text element to every question, um, which sometimes doesn't spell out exactly what you're looking for in the table. Um, I also draw parallels with abstract reasoning because a lot of the time you can eliminate answers quite quickly. Um, so you've got five things to choose from. If you guessed randomly, that would give you a 20% chance of getting it correct. However, if you're able to eliminate a couple of options uh, very quickly because they, they are obviously wrong, you've already increased your chances to 33%. I mean, if you get it down to, to two choices, even if you're not sure of the answer, you've got a 50% chance of getting it correct, which is much better than a guess. So uh, really useful to be able to look at, look at tables of information, particularly when pushed for time towards the end sometimes, be able to look to, at tables of information and say, this is relevant. Um, this is this is immediately ruled out these answers um, can really make it quicker uh, and more uh, increase your chances of performing to your best. So I'm going to look at all the different question types first and then go into them one by one. So uh, t so timetables firstly are uh, often where well, you're given timings, you're given a kind of 24 hour clock maybe or t or or time zones, and you have to figure out different different options, how to get somewhere, etc. And comparisons are, are, are typically these big tables with lots of different information in, where you have to pick out the best option using the information available. Um, stock levels, typically you're asked, um, you're given information about how much you have in stock, how much is used up. Uh, when you'll need to make new orders, um, and you've got to make some calculations around that. Scheduling, there's a couple different types. Um, there's room booking uh, uh, often, so when can you book in a course for something? This is very similar to comparisons, um, but there's also there's also ones very heavily based around time differences. So you'll have 
information about people in different time zones and you've got to say when each of them will be available for, for, for example for a conference call. Um, and project resourcing is a tricky type of question which looks and it gives you information about different people who are available to work on a project uh, and you've got to figure out how that project is going to be executed so how long will it take who's available at what times that sort of thing um, now these are uh, these will give you good experience in terms of knowing what to expect um, and how to tackle these during the EPSO test but they are not exhaustive um, so any kind of twists on these could happen or uh, it could be it could be that, um, that new types of questions do come up. However, this should give you lots of uh, lots of information about a lot of the questions that typically do come up. So I'm going to start looking at timetables. Um, and first we're going to use, um, well, the example we've got to the bottom is actually used on the, um, I think, the practice EPSO one, if you just search EPSO practice organizing and prioritizing question. Um, but it gives you an idea of what sort of things you can expect. So you'll typically be given a timetable or multiple timetables that, that, that have some sort of interaction. So one might be a plane time and another might be the, uh, the, the trains from there. And typically you'll be given sort of information like you have a, a, a meeting at this place and it takes five minutes to get from the station. Uh, what, what train do you need to get? What plane do you need to get to be able to make it in time? Um, now the question itself is therefore very important because it can add in that additional information that can be game-changing. Um, so if it says it takes you 15 minutes to get from the end of the train to the uh, the, the venue itself, you, you have to make sure you build that in and, and you know the, the, the multiple choice answers will be constructed so that if you forget to add that one up, consider that one element, you're, you're likely to pick a, an incorrect answer. Um, and as I said, there might be multiple elements to each journey, so you might have to think, oh, I've got to wait, I've got to, uh, I have to get it there, I have to get my plane in time to get there for my train, in time to get there for my, um, my, my meeting, or, or my boss's meeting, or, or, or what have you. Um, so, advice, uh, practice. So, so timetables is really one of the most straightforward things to practice. That's because there's lots of real-world timetables you can use as, uh, as practice. So you can look at things like bus times and train times and start work, working through them and thinking, how would I get to here at uh, this time? Uh, what, what, what time would I need to get? Uh, what time train would I need to get? Typically, we, we recommend um, working backwards. And this is I'm going to give you two approaches to doing this. I would suggest trying out both and seeing what typically works best for you um, and continuing to trial different, the, the two methods, working backwards and working forwards. Um, because some might be more appropriate for different questions. But, but working backwards is a very useful way to do it in terms of if you need to be somewhere for, for, for 9 a.m., for example, don't take the sort of starting time of the journey, but say, well, what train will get me into, or look at the timetable, what bus will get me in for 9 a.m.? And remember, you want to be there with time to spare. So um, if, if you've got kind of two, two buses, one that gets in at 8.55 um, and one that gets in at 9.01, the 901 one is too late. You'd have to get the 855. So as I said, 15 minutes early is better than one minute late. Um, so typically you can work back and as a, uh, take notes as you're going along so you can work your way back through the journey um, and figure out which answer is best. Now, another way you can do is work forwards. Uh, and when you're doing that, you'll typically be doing that from the answer options if you take this approach. So <clears throat> the first answer might say, start your journey at 1030. So you would then look to see well which which um, which which, uh, which which method of transport would uh, would I get if I left at 10:30? Well, it'd probably be the 11 o'clock one, um, and then work forwards and see if you'd get there in time. Then look at your other answer options and keep working forwards until you find the one that's most effective. Um, oh, and do pay attention to which way you're going as well um, when you're when you're planning a journey. Um, as I said, keep notes as you work through and practice using time um, so that you're kind of comfortable um, working through kind of tr complicated time things. So, so, so a train takes 26 minutes and needs to get in by 1.15 p.m. Well, what, what's the latest time it, it, it would be able to set off? So how do you subtract 26 minutes from 1.15 p.m.? What answer do you get? Um, for those who've tried to work it out, the answer is 12.49. Um, and think about using a 12-hour clock and a 24-hour clock. Can you convert the two quite quickly? Um, 
are you comfortable using both? Uh, and one final point is that um, that you're not supposed to say, say, oh, if there's a delay, and you know, go for the earliest possible train or, or what have you. But but do make sure you do have all the time you need to get between places. Okay, so the next type of question is comparisons. Now, to me, these are typically the most straightforward, but it may be that I'm more practiced in them. What you'll get is a table of information, and we've got a very simple one um, down here. Typically, there'll be a few more rows and a few more columns. Typically, there'll be five columns because that's where you'll get some of your answer options from. Um, and you've got to be able to make decisions based on uh, based on the table. So you might be told you need something with a certain number of megapixels, a, a camera with a certain number of megapixels for a certain cost. And you'd have to eliminate the um, the incorrect answers and choose the best option. Um, now, it will never be the case that you'll be told you'll have a question like this and I'll say it needs to be 16 megapixels and it'll be like, OK, it's, it's the elephant. There'll always be a couple of things, uh, which is why, again, just kind of keep track of what you're doing as you go along. So if you're told it needs to be at least 10 megapixels, you can cross out light pics. Um, if you're told it needs to be at least uh, uh, at least three inches, you can cross out 40 ED. And those two pieces of information, by kind of eliminating the whole column, have given brought you to this answer. Don't think that you can uh, sort of keep all that information in your head. Feel free to kind of take notes and say, oh, it can't be this one. Um, the human brain kind of just isn't really ready to deal with the complexity of some of these um, as is. So taking notes, kind of writing down light picks, no, or, or, or what have you, will help you kind of remember what is, uh, what's not effective. Um, and you have to make, you'll have to prioritize different components of the question itself. So in this question, it says you need to make 100 copies of an advertising brochure for a conference in two days' time. It is vital that it is in color, and if possible, it should be laminated. Which company do you use? <coughs> Excuse me. So if you look down the, the left-hand side, <coughs> you see a number of different factors. What you need to be able to do is say which information is absolutely critical. What can't you get away with not having? That's your first elimination criteria for things that don't meet that. And what is nice to have and what is irrelevant? Um, and sometimes sometimes there's a bit of a gray area between the nice to have and the irrelevant. So uh, something like cost, um, is if it's not mentioned here, you maybe still go for the cheaper option. Um, but that's kind of a sort of cross, sort of somewhere between nice to have and irrelevant. So, what is the essential information here? Um, you need to make a hundred copies, so you need someone who's able to make that those hundred copies. Um, it needs to be in two days' time. So, if the time required is longer, then that's going to be uh, vetoed. And it's vital that it is in color. What's next? Well, next we have our nice to have. So. Uh, things like price, <coughs> minimum quantity, etc. So uh, laminated, it says if possible it should be laminated. Price is obviously going to be um, a selling point if you have to make a decision. Minimum quantity as well. So I would argue in this in this case that if the minimum quantity was 200, you could still pay for that. And you know if, if all the other criteria was met, it would be okay. But obviously you're 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 getting more than you need. Um, maybe minimum quantity would interact with price per 50 copies for example if if they can say oh we need uh, we need 200 uh, we can only do 200 but they're so cheap then maybe that it's less of a prob problem the important point is that none of these are essentials none of these are are deal breakers it's not said you have a budget of this or it absolutely has to be laminated um so this is the second set of information you should be looking through um as we say, lower price is nice to have, um, but if there's no set budget, it's not essential. Um, could well have a set budget, though. I've seen plenty of questions that say, you know, you're trying to book a hotel room and you've got 300 euros for five nights. What do you do? That that sort of thing. Um, and then and then budget, then the, the, the cost, the price does become important. Anyway, it seems that delivery is irrelevant to this decision. So uh, only if nothing else is kind of nothing else is discriminating, would you fall back on delivery? So um, 
as I say, eliminate answer options one judgment criterion at a time, starting with what's important. So it needs to be done in two days, so that eliminates company Y. It's vital that it's in color, so that, and you see how we've kind of fully crossed out this now. It's vital that it's in color, so this is this. Um, and final criterion, uh, the final essential is, oh, I think that's, in fact, that's all of our essentials. Um, so if possible, it should be laminated. So we're down to company X and company Z. Uh, and company Z cannot laminate, and company X can. I mentioned price here, and in this particular case, price is also good. Oops, excuse me, sorry. In this case, price is also good. So it's cheaper, and they can laminate it. Um, sometimes you'll need to make a judgment call, but it shouldn't be too obscure. You're not you're not going to be expected to make a sort of values judgment versus you know price versus uh, whether they can do it in color. You're not you're not expected to do that. You're expected to be able to process it based on the information provided. There's no kind of the EU would always expect this to be in color. Um, therefore, you should have chosen the color option. If it needs color, it will say it needs color. So. Um, as I say, my key advice is to prioritize, find the essential information, and then work sequentially, starting out with the most essential stuff. You can use this to eliminate answers. So even if you did get to a point where you couldn't figure out quite what it meant, quite what it wanted, you might have eliminated all but two answers, and therefore your, your guess is going to be well informed. Um, sometimes you need to use verbal reasoning and a bit of thought. So you would like to be able to eat at the venue. Um, if it asks that, that, you're looking perhaps for a, a venue with a restaurant. Um, and sometimes you will have to, 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 to use a little bit of uh, extra working out in the question. So as, as I mentioned earlier, you have a budget for this amount for these many nights. Um, and you may need to use multiple tables as well. And if so, still take that same approach of trying to eliminate options so you can choose your final option. OK, so moving on to the next question type. Uh, and this is stock levels. Um, now, this one is kind of a little bit different from something you might have seen. So timetables and comparison tables are reasonably common, um, where a stock might seem a little bit different. But it breaks down reasonably straightforward when you just kind of familiarize yourself with it a little bit, know what to look out for. So you're usually given a series of products, um, and they work across different rows. Um, and you're given information about how much of that product there is at the moment, when you'd need to reorder that product, how much you're likely to use in a week, etc. Um, now, these are all different calculations. Um, like each row is a different question, basically. So it can be worked out separately. So work out cyan, work out magenta, work out yellow, work out black. But you don't have to kind of combine these. The question works across this way. And it's these column headings that you need to become familiar with, you need to be comfortable with. So the current stock level says how many ink cartridges you have. So you have 25 cyan ink cartridges. The average weekly uses says how much you'll use in a week. So if you use seven, uh, if, if there's a week from here, you'll use seven. So you'll have 18 left. See, it's, it's kind of straightforward when, when you get into it, uh, when you actually look at the uh, calculation. Um, reorder at, so how many do you need before you need to reorder? And how many would you reorder uh, when you make that reorder? So when you get down to 11, you'd buy another 25 uh, in this case. So this is actually reasonably straightforward. But as I said, work it out one row at a time and take notes. So if we look at cyan ink cartridges quickly, you've got 25. In week two, you'll have 18. In week three, uh, sorry, in two weeks' time, you'll have 11 left. And that's when you'll be reordering. And that's just more maths. But instead of subtracting, uh, when you get there, you're just adding. So you're going to add 25 onto 11. Um, so if you'd gone below 11, you'd have added 25 onto whatever number you had. Um, and, and then you can work from there as well. So you're going to continue to use the same rate. So you've, 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 you've reordered 11, so you've got to 36. <clears throat> But now you've used another seven, so you've got to 29. So these are relatively straightforward. But as I say, they're very unfamiliar to, 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 to people. They're not a sort of standard in the same way the timetable is. So it's very easy to see them and think, 
oh, I don't know what's going on. Bit of practice and you can usually understand. Um, I mean, the rows don't interact, so that makes it very easy. So you can calculate one at a time. And you can quite, you can make, if you make brief notes, you can very quickly double check your logic and working. You don't have to rerun through a very complex uh, numerical reasoning um, operation. <laughs> So we're going to look at scheduling now. Um, there's actually a couple of types of scheduling question that, 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 that we've identified. Um, there's the ones that can be very similar to comparisons. So you've just got to figure out kind of when people are available, um, uh, when different rooms are available, etc. What days uh, would they be appropriate? A lot of the time you're looking for clashes. So you're looking for, oh, and sorry, the other type of question is when you're specifically given people's availability in terms of a time. And you have to figure out when everyone's available, typically for a conference call. So you're looking for clashes. You're looking for things that don't quite, um, that won't quite work. So when, it, when is everyone available? Well, you need to eliminate when different people definitely aren't available. Um, again, as I said, eliminating. Um, you need to be comfortable with 24-hour clocks. And you need to be very comfortable with time zones, um, particularly for scheduling uh, of calls. Um, and you may need to work from multiple tables as well. Um, it's also possible that questions can build on each other. So you'll have information in one question that will then be uh, brought back up again in the next question, going beyond the table. So, so you could have multiple tables, but also quest information in the question that hints to your answer. So to look at uh, scheduling example one. So this is the comparison table type um, question I was talking about. You've been asked to organize a training course in Microsoft Excel for 15 students. So you can use the same information there. Um, so you need it to be for 15 students, and it needs to be in Microsoft Excel. Well, these are our, um, this is our capacity. So you can see uh, that the Washington room won't be available uh, for, for that, because you need 15. Um, in fact, what I've done here is just highlighted everything that uh, that, that, that sort of works out. Um, so these are the three people: Albert, Claude, and Edith can all do Excel training. Uh, and Washington, uh, sorry, Jefferson and Roosevelt can both do the uh, 15 students can both handle that number. Um, so what you're looking for now is a, a day in common that works out. Um, as soon as possible. So this is the sort of nice to have information. Now you've worked out the essential. Now that you've worked out, definitely has to be Excel. Definitely has to be at least 15 people. Um, you need to know what is the earliest you can do it. And what you might do here is just work forwards from the uh, from the from from the back. So you might say, well, Monday. Uh, well, Monday can't be done because neither Jefferson or Roosevelt can do Monday, so Monday won't work. Um, Tuesday. Uh, well, Tuesday works for Jefferson, but neither Albert, Claude, nor Edith can do Tuesday. Wednesday, though, we've got a couple of people. We've got Claude and Edith, uh, and the Roosevelt room will work for that. So that becomes your kind of next criteria. Um, then we have our, 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 as I mentioned, our scheduling, um, and these require familiarity with time zones. And time zones would be something that if you're not comfortable with, we'd very strongly recommend uh, practicing. Um, so in particular, uh, this sort of compare, you might be asked to compare like GMT to, to, to Brussels and, uh, or Central European time. As I mentioned, it's not about knowing this because this information will be given to you. It's not about knowing the difference. It's about being able to work out that difference. So when it's 10 a.m. in London, it's 11 a.m. in Brussels. So UK is said to be one hour behind Brussels. It is said that UK is CT minus one. So if you wanted to get onto Brussels time, you'd reverse that operation. You'd add one to get it back to that CT. So if you know the time in, in UK, you just need to add an hour. So we've got a couple of uh, worked examples. So uh, very briefly, so we know the time zone. We know the Central European time. So how do we work out their time? Well, you just follow that operation. It's Central European time minus three hours, plus two hours, minus one hour, minus two hours. Working it the other way, though, is where people can get confused. So here you see we're working from CET. So we're using that operation as is. In the following table, we're going from um, their time to CET. So when it's midday for Tom, oh, it's the same. When it's midday for Jessica, um, CET time will be three hours later. Um, and you can see this kind of works backwards. 
um, th this kind of it can be confusing because it's essentially the, the opposite operation just depending on which way round these are but just think of it as to work out central European time just 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 sorry to work out the other time just calculate it from central European time um, so we've got a kind of more worked example here that I'm only going to very briefly go over um, you've been asked to book in a teleconference meeting between your manager and four colleagues in four different time zones uh, actually five here um, the meeting needs to last an hour what is the latest time you could book the meeting for so what we would recommend is to and this is a particularly fiendish question as well because it's got morning and afternoon times um, and what we would recommend is converting those times to Central European time to one time zone um, so reverse that operation if it's 1130 in in Europe it's going to be 830 for Jessica wherever she is um, and then you'll get something like this this row here or these rows here that tell you um, the specific times and then you can start to actually work it out and um, if you can work out availability here without this step that's very impressive um, highly recommend this step in working out your answers so in this case um, the question itself uh, if you recall said what's the latest time the meeting can can finish what I would do is look at the latest possible time of all of these um, people because that will be the latest possible time the meeting can finish um, it, you know um, it can definitely not end late it can definitely not end later than 1500 hours because Lucian definitely couldn't be available and then work back and see who else is uh, see if it check if everybody else is available to work at that time so we're knowing it's going to last an hour um, this would be 1400 hours to 1500 hours and that's not going to work for these people so work backwards um, 1400 hours so what about 1400 hours can everyone do that when you review it you'll find that they can so this person 1300 to 1400 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 so there's a little bit of kind of checking and and and, and kind of making sure you what i would recommend is as soon as you kind of notice this 1500 hours and you start working backwards you make a note of it and you start working from there um if that doesn't happen cross it out and 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 work out the sort of time before that that might work um, and remember to subtract that time of the meeting off as well remember they're not asking what time will the meeting end um, often you'll have those scheduling questions where there's a there's only a little bit of overlap anyway so it won't say what is the latest or what is the earliest time it will just say what time can they meet you'll be given five example times and only one of those will work um, now I want to talk about project resourcing now this is the most um, I believe this is the most fiendish of the question types um, in this you're given a table like the one here <coughs> with different stages of a project and the amount of time each of those stages takes and you're told who can who can do each stage of the project so this is stage one it's going to take 10 days and only Beatrice and Charles are able to do it Ava is not able to do it and what you need to do is work out the different how long different um, stages will take typically and how long the project will take overall um, so you're given further information so that's in the questions so how many people can work on a project at once and um, in this example here we've got we, we we're told that, that, that two can um, what does that mean here well it means that you've got two people working on it and it would take 10 man days uh, therefore two people working on it full time could complete it in half that time because both of them would be working on it on the same day and um, so this could potentially only take five days However, the final twist in this already difficult question type is this unavailable. Um, and this tells you what day the person is unavailable, what day or days the person might be unavailable. So in this case, we've got, day, we've got uh, five days worth of work here. Um, oh, and the other thing is that, that these stages are sequential as well. So you have to do stage one first. So stage one is going to be on days one, two, three, four, and five. However, Charles can't work on it on day, th on day three, and Beatrice can't work on it on day four. Um, so you're going to fall behind. Um, as we say, this would take five days total uninterrupted, but Charles is unavailable one day and Beatrice is unavailable another. Um, what I do, especially when you're kind of <coughs> practicing these to start with, is you can draw out these little tables that show who can work on a stage at any time. So 
We know Ava is never available. These are the days Beatrice and Charles can work on it. And um, what we've done is put no on the days they can't work on it. And then you can just count up the days. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So ten days of the project will be done after day six. Um, something to be aware of is when you when you can have two people working on a project at once, for every day someone is unavailable, the project loses half a day. Um, so be aware of that. So we see that we're losing a day through Beatrice, um, and the project has lost half a day here. Then we're losing a day through uh, Charles. I got that the wrong way around, but the point still stands. We're using a day through Charles, and the project loses half a day here. Um, another thing to bear in mind is I uh, mentioned um, that you can kind of quickly work out without the unavailability how long uh, a stage will take. So this would be five days with full availability. That's worth making a note of as well to kind of get an idea of how long the project should take overall. Um, you know, we, if we work this out as five days plus five days um, absolute minimum, um, now this is 10 days, but if we work this out as if, if we had lots of people to work on this, this would be five days, this would be five days, 10 days overall, you know that you're looking for something that's, that's at least 10 days in length from the answer options. Again, this can help you eliminate answers. So um, now look at stage two. So we've worked out that this is going to take you six days, the, f the first um, part of the project. Uh, and the next part, stage two, can only be done by Ava, but she's actually unavailable on day six. So if you'd not worked out stage one correctly, you'd thought, oh, Ava's going to be kind of ruled out. However, she doesn't start until day seven. Um, so six days uh, of Beatrice and Charles working pretty solidly on the project, uh, and then Ava taking over. She's the only person who can do it, so this full 10 days is going to stand in this case. Uh, but she's not losing any days. So say this had been day seven uh, when she was unavailable, we'd have needed to add on an extra one there. But essentially we've got the six from stage one, and we can add on this 10, and that gives us 16 days. That is our complete answer. So these are a type of question that, uh, that, that people have said to me they find very difficult, and I'm not at all surprised. We've, we've got a full worked example in the pro webinar uh, for practice and EU training offers plenty of these for practice as well. Um, so it's a really good, good, good advice I think to get used to them, get used to a system that works for you. Um, I showed this table here as one way of very quickly working out who can work on stuff. So that might work for you. Uh, alternatively, you might become comfortable with this whole taking off half a day for every day someone's away. Um, technique, uh, in which case use that. Um, pay attention to the so practice, of course. Pay attention to the instructions and the questions themselves. So often they'll say things like two, like two people can work on, on a stage at a time, or these stages must be completed sequentially, or or might make a comment about unavailability. The question itself might say. Assuming full availability, how long will this project take? So you have to, you can then ignore that bottom row. Um, pay close attention. Um, as I said, learn how to account for unavailability in planning timelines. So the first step is to look at these tables and think, what about how quick would this be with full availability? But then to build in this accounting for unavailability. Work out each stage one at a time. As I showed just then, it can have a knock-on effect. If you're late for something, if, if something spills over a little bit, it's a bit slower than you'd think. Um, it may be that certain people become available or become unavailable. Um, as I say, if you've got full availability, it's usually quite quick to work out the number of days. So if it said 12 days and you can have three people working per day, it's just a four-day task. Um, it's just simple division. It's that unavailability that I think makes it particularly fiendish. Um, one thing I've noticed from reviewing example questions uh, from EPSO is that often later in the project, everybody is uh, available. So if you can work out, and, and you know that's kind of true to life as well in a way, and that when you start off a project, lots of people are busy in the next few weeks. But if you say, are you available in three weeks time to support, they're like, yeah, I can put aside that time now. And what that means is often for the later stages, you just need to use your full availability calculation, um, just need to add on some extra numbers rather than having to kind of do this, uh, account for this unavailability. So often you'll find the later stages, if you've got kind of four stages to work through in a project, you'll find that the later ones are actually not affected by unavailability. And that makes calculating uh, 
easier. Certainly for, 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 for me, it does at least. Um, so that's an overview of the, the five kind of common types of questions. Going to give you some general tips and tricks now. So the important thing you should do is uh, look at look at the question, look at the information available, and see how quickly. Instead of panicking about kind of how much information is there, how much you could work out, see what is relevant and and find out where it is in the table. So if you're looking at stock level and all it's asking is when do you need to restock your cyan ink cartridges. None of the other rows are relevant uh, for that particular question. So you can very quickly work out an answer without being overwhelmed by the complexity. Even if it is asking a stock question for different things, you can kind of work through it slowly and sequentially. Um, do try to understand the different types of tables. As I said, at the beginning, we have things like, um, we have things like timetables, uh, which you probably have a little bit of experience with. Later on, question types that I've discussed today, Things like project resourcing take a little bit more time. Uh, you're probably less familiar with, so you probably need to take a little bit more time understanding them. When you're looking at the different types of information, if you're not explicitly practicing, so if you're not kind of sat down answering the questions as quickly as possible, try to think about what you could get out of this information. Um, what sort of um, what what information would uh, would it give you? How you could use it to get to answers very quickly. Um, how you could eliminate different things. So it's possible that uh, with a scheduling question, for example, you see that um, someone's not going to be able to start until at least 11 due to time differences. So you can immediately eliminate anything before that. And that might be something you notice straight away um, and can very quickly help you get to it, at least narrow down your answer options. And as I said, look for what, what, what information is essential and what is nice to have, um, particularly with comparisons and some of the scheduling. Um, you have to, you have to rule out certain things, but then you have to go based on what would be best. Um, and yeah, be comfortable kind of jumping around the table or the different tables to find the information relevant to different questions. So they're multi-part, but you'll become familiar with the table as you work through. So that will give you more time to uh, work in even more depth. Um, as I said, make sure you consider every aspect. So understand the question in in full. What is it asking you? And practice. So practice the questions, but also practice the skills relevant to the questions. And even when you're not doing, uh, when you're not practicing these specific things, look at look at data and say, look at timetables and say, what sort of things, what questions could be asked from it, what sort of conclusions can be drawn. Um, a final final piece of advice is when you do practice, try to practice under appropriate time pressure. So. Um, sets of questions within the time limit that you'd have to make sure that you're kind of going through at the right speed, you know when you might need to make a final guess, for example. Um, this is going to be what makes you, the, the, the closer you can replicate EPSO exam conditions, the closer, the more familiar you'll be, the less nervous you'll be when actually taking it. So do try and do try and kind of get some real quality practice in rather than kind of looking at a few questions from time to time and saying, oh, I broadly understand how I think I'd get there. Put yourself under that pressure. So thank you very much for attending the uh, beginner webinar. As mentioned, this is followed by our pro webinar. So this is that's a bit more live. Um, means there'll be live example questions which you'll get to uh, answer and then I'll talk through the answers. But there'll also be the opportunity to ask me plenty of questions as well. So uh, do bring your questions to that if uh, if if uh, if you feel I can be of value. Um, and all it's left for me to say is thank you very much for attending the webinar and best of luck um, with your application processes. Thank you very much.